I'm the Director of Financial Assistance at Florida State University, and I'm just here to talk to you about uh, several topics that are near and dear to our hearts in uh, financial aid, uh, what we need to know about financial aid. So some of the topics we're going to discuss tonight are what financial aid is, um, the cost of attendance, expected family contribution, uh, financial need, categories, uh, types of sources of financial aid. Probably the thing that you're going to be most interested in is the FAFSA application and special circumstances. Okay, so financial aid. Um, I think there's a lot of confusion sometimes about it. It isn't just the aid that you get from completing the FAFSA. Financial aid consists of any funds. Um, scholarships, grants, and tour study provided to students and families to help pay for the post-secondary educational expenses. So it can also include outside scholarships, things from the community, that type of thing. Okay? So the cost of attendance, something that you'll hear in the financial aid office, if you ever uh, just go hang out in there, um, we'll sometimes talk about the cost of attendance. And basically what it is, is it includes any of the um, components that we would consider part of the student's um, package to be able to tell how much they we should give them in financial aid each year. So these would include things like tuition and fees, their room and board, books and supplies, their transportation costs, um, personal expenses. These can be both, um, these include both direct and indirect costs. So, direct costs will be things like their tuition and fees and room and board. The indirect costs will be things like their personal expenses, like shampoo, um, jeans, things that they'll need to be able to get through the next four years. Um, but it this would be one year's cost of attendance. Um, and this varies widely from college to college. Um, I was listening to the prior um, uh, presentation and they were talking about how much it costs to go to each school and that really does determine the cost of attendance in the financial aid office of each of those schools because going to uh, KU is obviously going to cost more than going to the basic university. So our cost of attendance will vary. Um, the expected family contribution, you'll hear us say AFC. Um, that will actually be changing in the next couple of years from the expected family contribution to the student aid index. Um, this is actually an index that helps us determine the need that your student will have to go to school. So when they complete the VASPA, um, their AFC is calculated through the questions that they answer on the VASPA. Um, and basically what they figure out is the amount that the family can reasonably um, contribute to the student's education. Now I'll have parents say to me, I can't afford to contribute $5,000 to my student's education. And we understand that. Um, the, the government has their own calculations and those are really complicated. But I believe when they go to the student aid index, it's supposed to make it a little bit more so we'll see how that turns out. Um, the EFC does not change from college to college. So whatever their EFC is um, will be true across any college that they go to. So that expected family contribution can seem much bigger at some colleges and much smaller at others because of the cost that it goes that it would cost them to go there. Um, there are two components to it, the parent contribution and the student contribution. So when you answer um, questions on the FAFSA, there are going to be income questions for both, both parent and the student. Um, they use that in calculating um, what the students and the families expect the family contribution are going to be. So how we figure out the student's financial need. Um, take the class of attendance at the school that the student is going to. 
we subtract the expected family contribution, and that gives us how much need the student has at any individual school. That will vary by from school to school because, as you can tell, if number one is the higher cost school, let's say Yale, and number two is a mid cost school, let's say KU, and number three is a community college, then that expected family contribution is going to make a huge difference at, say, one of the schools. So their need is going to be higher at Yale than it's going to be at the community college. Okay, so there are several types of financial aid. Well, there's two. Two types of financial aid. There's gift aid and there's self-help aid. So we don't talk about these a lot. We probably won't say them very often. But gift aid are the types of aid that your student would receive and not necessarily be expected to pay back. So scholarships or grants. Anytime you see that, the student is getting that money to go to school. As long as they do that piece and go to their classes, they get that money and they don't have to pay it back. Um, the other is self-help aid. Self-help aid includes money that the student has to do something to be able to receive the aid. So, for instance, that the work study, the student has to get a job and they have to earn that. For loans, the student has to agree that they're borrowing this money and someday they are going to pay it back. Um, there are several different sources of financial aid. I know that this is something of a repeat of what was said earlier. So these, um, the federal government, states, colleges and universities, private sources, employers, all of these places, could be sources of financial aid and would possibly need to be reported to the financial aid office. Um, so, what's up for students? Number one, and the thing that people most want, um, but the one that requires the highest need, is Pell Grants. Um, this type of aid is based on the expected family contribution. Um, it is automatic if they are eligible for it. So when you complete the FAFSA at the very end, you will actually receive an email or a, some kind of notification that lets you know that the student is eligible for this much um, financial aid and in, what, in which tax. So if they are Cal eligible, it will let you know right away. If they are only eligible for loans, it will also let you know that. Um, for, I didn't change, we didn't change. Uh, what are we supposed to do? Oh, sorry. That's right, that doesn't come out until February. Okay, 21 22, the maximum annual award amount is 6495 so during this year. Um, that typically goes up by about $100 every year, so we expect that it will go up. It's not a guarantee, however, so we're not really sure, but um, I'm guessing it will. Um, SEOG. Is the supplemental grant. Um, this is also for needy students and it's only based on availability. So for students who are completing their FAFSA earlier, um, that is actually a benefit because we still have funds at that time. So it's always a good idea to get your FAFSA in early because SEOG, once we run out, we don't have any more to go. Um, teach grant um, is a special type of aid that acts like a, like a grant, but is actually a loan. So students have to actually agree to teach in specific either areas or a specific um, demographic. So in other words, they either have to say, I'm going to teach in a low income area, or I'm going to teach a specific um, subject like math, science, um, any of the STEM uh, uh, curriculums. So, if they are in the in a teaching program and they agree to do this, they can get a teach grant. Now, um, we don't often like say, "Go ahead and take one," 
Because if they fail to meet the obligation, because it's a so many year obligation for each year that you borrow, um, they end up having to pay the money back. It becomes a, an unsubsidized loan. So just so you're aware, if they ever are, if they are a teacher, if they want to become a teacher, and they are going to take this grant, they do have to um, abide by all of the criteria. Okay. Um, Kansas Comprehensive Grant is determined by Kansas legislators. It's only available at four-year colleges and universities, and it's based on availability, so they do need to apply for that. Um, do they apply? Or do they just I'm sorry. Yeah, so they just need to have it in by the, they have to have the best friend by the priority deadline. Okay, so what's out there? Oh, yeah, so, so work study. Federal work study is a job that they get on campus, so if they're eligible for it, it's not a guaranteed job. They just are being told that if you find a job on campus, you can be paid these funds. So, um, <clears throat> it's a part-time job. They're only um, allowed to work up to 20 hours a week, and the, the philosophy in most schools, and including 4 days, is that school comes first. Um, you cannot work during school time. That's actually a federal regulation. Um, but most most schools will be pretty flexible if they have a, a federal work study job. Um, and then federal direct loans. There's, uh, there's two types of federal direct loans. There's the subsidized and unsubsidized for students. Um, the freshman annual loan limit is 5500 for dependent students. So if your student um, would fit in the category of independent, and that's um, pretty narrow because they have to be either 24 or meet some other um, uh, the criteria, which would be like if they were married or had a child that they supported, then they could be independent and that amount would go up. Um, the interest rate for 2122 was 3.73 for both the subsidized and the unsubsidized loans. Okay. Um, there's also two types of plus loans. Um, one is for parents, and the other is for um, graduate students. I'm not going to talk about the grad student plus loans because um, most of your students are probably not going to be going after a master's or a doctorate in the next year or two. So the parent plus loan is offered to the parent if the cost of attendance has not been met by the awards that have been given to the student at, that, at the time. So in other words, if we give them Pell and we give them loan, we give them loans in their award letter, and that doesn't equal the cost of attendance, then we will also offer the parent plus loan. Um, some schools will not offer it, and you have to ask for it. Um, the parent plus loan is a loan that the parent borrows. So if the student says, yes, I'm interested in taking this, that does not mean that they're borrowing it. Because we will then reach out to the parent and say, okay, your student has indicated that they're interested in accepting this. Do you really want to take it? Um, so you will need to be watching your emails, uh, email address um, to see if we are communicating with you so that um, you can fill out anything that is necessary to be able to get the parent plus loan. Okay. So um, additionally, there are private and alternative loans that are available to students. Um, these are typically applied for at outside agencies like Salome or um, there's other agencies. We don't actually promote any of them. Um, we do have some that we list on our website, and so you would need to go um, to our website and look if you were interested in taking an alternative loan. Um, typically, the interest rates are a little bit higher than some of these, um, and we often discourage you from taking those if you don't have to because the interest rate is higher, and so um, we think that the federal option is better if you have to take them. Okay, so now we're going to move on to FAFSA. Um, 
I know this is probably the most complicated part for a lot of parents completing the FAFSA. Um, the first thing that you need to know is that you will need an FSA ID and your student will need an FSA ID. Um, you each need to um, complete uh, on the Department of Ed website. Um, there's a space for this at studentmade.gov, FSA ID, create account. Um, you will create a username and a password, and you each need to have your own email address. Um, it is strongly encouraged that you have your student do their own, and you do your own as the parent. Um, this has to happen before the FAFSA can be completed and signed, so if you're going to do it online. So it's a good idea to go out there and do this. Um, I always tell parents, really good idea to keep this with your taxes. Because each year you're going to have to go and get your taxes to fill out the FAFSA. And so this should be where you keep your FSA, your ID, password, and theirs as well. Um, they will also need the FSA ID to fill out um, interest counseling and that's a promissory note. And the parent, um, you as a parent will also need it if you decide to do the parent plus loan to apply for it and to do the master concert note for that. Okay, so how do you do the free application for federal student um, aid? If you're like me, you remember the paper, like that packet, and you had to fill it out with a pen and mail it in, and then you waited. Well, they've kind of changed that a little bit now. So now they have several different places you can go. There's that on the web, which is at studentaid.org. Well, several of them. Several of them are on the web, but um, studentaid.org has that on the web. Um, this is where you would electronically fill out your FAFSA. Um, you can use the data retrieval tool when you're here. So this is what we strongly encourage because it's quick, it's easy, you know almost immediately what the student's um, financial aid eligibility is. Um, another option is also the My Student My Student Aid Mobile App, which is exactly the same as FAFSA on the web, it's just on your phone. So they designed it to look a little bit different, but it does essentially the same thing. Um, you can still do the paper FAFSA. Um, you do have to actually print that out. Nobody actually keeps those packets anymore. Um, you do have to fill it out, mail it in. It takes a very long time. The Central Processing Center will take a really long time. So it will take them forever to get it in. Um, so we often tell people we get about 12 weeks if you do it this way before you'll know anything about your financial aid. Um, you can also at certain schools, go and ask them to help you with the FAFSA. Um, they can do it at FAA access to CPS. Most schools won't do this. Most schools will have you come in, sit down, fill out the FAFSA with your students in the office. But they don't want to be responsible for this because they have to keep the signature page forever. And so they don't want to do this. Um, and then the last one is FAFSA on the phone. It's like your last resort. You can actually call them. They will talk to you and help you through it. But again, you will have to fill out, you'll have to print out the signature page, you'll have to sign it and mail it in. Again, we're back to 12 weeks. So don't let it go. Okay, so when you do go to studio.gov, this is the home page. Um, if you go up there to the middle where it says apply for aid, if you can see that, I don't know, my eyes are getting bad now, but um, that is where you would actually um, click to get started, and that will pull down the thing that says complete the FAFSA form, okay, and that takes you here to the welcome page. Um, if you have never filled out the FAFSA before, if your student has never filled out the FAFSA before, they would start on new to the FAFSA process. The next year, it will be a returning student, and they can log in, and it will auto-fill. So it'll be really nice the second year if, you, if your student, if you've had a student who's gone through college so far, um, you may be doing this 
we're trying to use a process now that the first time they get to do that, start here at the top. Okay, my student in mobile app, again, looks very similar, but it's not exactly the same because it's on your mobile app, because it's on your phone. Um, but you do have the ability to get in here and then go over, like save it, and go over to your computer if you wanted to come back to it later. So it's really nice. You can swap back and forth between these two, um, and it will save it for you as long as you like put in a save key. Okay. So the fast fed information is used to calculate the accepted family contribution. Um, 22, for 22, 23, for every year, the FAFSA opens on October 1. So, um, so this October, it will open for 22, 23. We encourage you to get started as soon as you can. Um, I know I heard them say the priority deadline for um, most of the schools in Kansas, and for like for Big State University. That's December 1. Um, that doesn't mean you can't continue to fill out the FAFSA after December 1. It just means that's when we like to get it because then we can guarantee that we will get all of our processes done and your student will have their aid letter or aid offer um, sooner and they'll be able to make some decisions about where they want to go. Um, for 2023, you will need to use your 2020 tax data. So not from this last April, but the April before. Um, and we'll say this, and I'm going to talk about it later, but if your circumstances financially have changed, please talk to the financial aid office wherever your student decides to go, because they can actually um, maybe perform a professional judgment, um, depending on how much money you might have lost in that year. Um, especially with COVID, you know, we expect that there will be a lot of that. Um, and you do have to complete it as you think of it. Okay, so student demographics. Um, when the student logs in and uses their FSA to get in, they will start to fill out their student demographics. So this is including their, their legal name. Um, please do not use nicknames because um, the government does do checks. And so we need to make sure that these are full and um, Their social security number, and it will ask their gender. Now this question will be going away. Um, this is um, related to selective service, and um, up until this year, for 21, 20, 20, 22, or 22, 23, I can't remember, they just took away um, that piece, uh, that piece is an eligibility component, so while we're still asking the question about gender for selective service, that isn't necessarily determining whether they're eligible for financial aid anymore. So um, in the next year or two, we will be removing that question from the FAFSA, but it's not this year. So you will see it in 22-23, but I think for 23-24, you won't see that question anymore. Okay, so student eligibility section citizenship. Um, students do have to be citizens to get financial aid or they need to be an eligible non-citizen. So if they meet one of those two criteria, um, then they should be good. They will need a social security number and if they're an eligible non-citizen, they'll need a social security number and an alien registration number. I will say this, this still doesn't cover DACA students. So if you have a student who is a DACA student, um, they're still not eligible for financial aid yet. Um, grade levels, students cannot be graduate students for certain types of aid. So they wouldn't be eligible for Pell or subsidized loans if they were graduate student. Now I don't anticipate that that is probably an issue in here, but if they are seniors and they're taking concurrent classes, they aren't eligible for aid. So um, just so you know, they won't get it until they become a freshman in college. Okay. 
So they also need to be degree seeking. They need to either be um, going for an associate, a bachelor's, a master's, a PhD, or certain certificate programs. There are eligible certificate programs, so that is something that could potentially be included. And foster care. I don't know why this is on here, but um, I do know that we will talk later about dependency status and foster care. If they were ever in foster care, will um, it does determine whether they're an independent student, um, especially if they were in foster care after they turned 13. Okay. Um, in this section, they do actually have to select their college. They cannot not select a college. It has to be filled out or won't go anywhere. And they could save it. They could come back and save it, but if they don't put a college in there, just nobody's going to get this information. Um, they can select up to 10. None of the colleges will see which colleges were selected. They'll only see that they were selected. Um, housing question helps to determine the cost of attendance. So if students are living at home with their parents, that could potentially make their cost of attendance lower. But they do have the ability to change their mind. This is not their housing contract. It's not the application for housing. So if they say, I'm going to live on campus, they still need to do the application for housing to, to actually live on campus. And they can change their mind. Okay. So here's the dependency questions. If they can say yes to any of these 13 things, they would be considered independent. Now, if they are considered independent, it does change the amount of aid that we can give them because um, independent students actually are allowed to borrow more money than dependent students. Um, if they say no, to all of these questions, they're dependent, and they would have to answer the questions for their parents. Okay, so parent information on the FAFSA. I think the most tricky and confusing thing for most parents are if the parents are divorced. So, what we get for questions the most is which parent do we choose because they live with mom, but dad pays, um, that dad pays child support and he claims them on the taxes. So how you determine this is if they're divorced or separated, whichever student or whichever parent provided the most support and they lived with during the past 12 months, okay? If the parent is remarried, then you have to include the step parent as parent two. Okay? So it's not they include the two parents that are divorced, they include the parent that provided the most financial support and their spouse. Grandparents, foster parents, and legal guardians are not considered parents unless they legally adopted the student. So, to complete the FAFSA, we'll need to have gathered a few things. Number one is going to be tax documents from the correct year. So for 2022-2023, that's going to be your 2020 taxes. Um, you're going to want your W-2s. Um, if you have businesses, you're going to want to have any forms that go along with that. Asset information, you do not have to include your 401k or your IRA balances. And you do not include the value of your primary residence. This is really important if you own a farm. Because if you live on the farm, you do not include the farm as an asset. If you don't live on the farm, you do have to include it as a business asset. Does this make sense? Um, untaxed income, such as child support, does need to be reported. So any, any kinds of untaxed income, you should be reporting on it. Um, it's a really good idea to use the IRS data retrieval tool when it's offered to you as long as you qualify to use it. Uh, this, in 
ensures that all of the information that's coming to the FAFSA is accurate because, because it's coming directly from the IRS and it means we do not have to worry about it being selected for verification for tax information. Um, you will not see the information that is brought over. You'll just see a bunch of X's when it's actually done. The only people that actually see the tax information are the people who work at the financial aid office in school that you provided on FAFSA. Um, oops, let me move that back in there. Um, this does reduce the documents that we'll ask for later if you use it. And um, you can only use it if you were either single and you're still single, or if you were married um, jointly and you're still married and, and you're not divorced or the woman of that type of thing that you, that you would have like a conflict. So if that's all still true, um, then you can use it. If not, you would probably have to enter that information manually. Um, if you also do not have social security numbers, it won't work. And if you were married and you filed separately, it won't work. So those are some areas where it might trip you up. Um, if you are in a situation where you don't have a social security number, um, you have to start, you have to put all nines. So, okay. There are certain tax filers who cannot use the IRS, IRS data retrieval tool. These are all listed here. Um, if you didn't complete a fax, or if you didn't complete your taxes, if you're married after January 21st, if the first three digits of the social security number are 666, um, if you filed a non-US non tax return, um, file as head of household or file separate returns. Neither married parent entered a valid social security number or non-married parent or both married parents entered all zeros for the social security number. So if any of those things are true, then you would not be able to use the IRS data retrieval tool and you would have to enter that information manually. Okay, so there are several Best errors that happen frequently. Um, a lot of times people will transpose numbers on the social security number. So it's really important to have the social security card in front of you and copy it exactly. Um, parents who are divorced and remarried will put in their wrong parental information. Like I said, sometimes they'll list like um, parent one is mom and parent two is dad, but they're divorced. So um, that type of thing happens a lot. Income earned by parents or step parents, um, sometimes they won't include the step parents' tax information, and so that is pretty frequent. Untaxed income, so if it wasn't something that you had to report on your taxes, you might just not add it in there. You need to, though. Um, U.S. income tax is paid. Um, the household size, um, we've seen people forget, you know, children. A lot of times it's because the child is in college. They're under 24 years old and they still cons they're still considered independent, but you forget them because you consider them independent. Um, number of household members in college, you do not include, if the parent is in college, you do not include them in the number of people who are in college and um, real estate and investment work and what assets to include. You can make corrections um, and if we have any information that we know, um, we ask you for documentation, we will make corrections on your behalf. Just so you know. Um, after you file, you will receive a summary of your application that will be sent to you. Like I said, it will tell you if the student qualified for the Pell or if they only qualified for loans. Um, this is called the student aid report. Um, if they need to go back out and find it electronically, they can go back in with their FSA ID, log back in, and they can find this on the web as well. Um, the school, if the school 
provides further information or documentation, we will contact the student directly. We typically email some schools, we'll still send a letter. Um, so you want to make sure you know how each school communicates with them. And you also need to understand that as soon as your student is enrolled in a university or college, they fall under the FERPA rights. So FERPA is the Federal Educational Right to Privacy Act, and basically it tells the student that they have the right to their own records, and that we can't share those, that information with anyone unless they give us permission. So just so you're aware, as soon as they know, they fall into the FERPA regulations. Um, you do want to let your student know that award notifications will be coming. And so knowing how the school um, communicates is gonna be really important because, for instance, for Katie's only sends emails unless we don't have an email address. Um, some schools will send paper letters out still. So just so you can be more aware. Um, after you file the FASTA, oh, sorry, I'm going wrong way. Sorry. Um, can I? Okay. So special circumstances. This is what I was talking about professional judgment earlier. So we understand that, well, first of all, let's talk about this. If anything changes after you fill out the FAFSA, because the FAFSA is a snapshot in time. And so, for instance, if the student were um, living at home in the spring, and they're a dependent student, and then they go out in the summer and they get in, and they fill out the FAFSA at this point. And they go out and they get married in the summer, they're now an independent student, but they cannot go back into the FAFSA and change that information. They need to contact their financial aid office because that's one of the things that we would typically have to decide how that needs to change. Okay? Um, but, if there were changes in employment status, unusual medical expenses not covered by insurance, or change in parent, uh, parent marital status, those types of things, they can also notify us and we can look into it to see if maybe they would be eligible for help. So in 2020, if you need $100,000 and then you lost your job in 2021, we would want to know about that. Um, most state offices will require a written explanation and documentation. Um, you will want to contact that office and find out what it is that they need to be able to, um, to make that happen for you. Um, the college will review and request additional information if it's necessary, and decisions are final, cannot be appealed with the Department of Education because professional judgment decisions are something that the school has um, the ability to say they will or will not do. Okay, so some things that could be considered special circumstances would be unusual or an uncovered medical and dental expenses. Um, that's not something they ask about on the FAFSA. So if that's true, you would want to talk to your financial aid administrator. Um, if the parent or spouse dies, um, if there's loss of employment, if there's extraordinary dependent care. We do actually, part of the cost of attendance, typically include dependent care for independent students, but if the parents have like several um, children who are under five, um, we don't necessarily include that, and so it may be something that we could look at, um, divorce, Secondary school tuition and the student cannot, cannot obtain parental information. So this would be considered for independent appeal. There is that option, but that one is pretty limited. So um, just being uh, paying on taxes, taking care of themselves, they wouldn't necessarily fall in the category of um, being an independent student through a professional judgment. 
Okay, so satisfactory academic progress. The government says that to receive a student has to maintain certain standards for satisfactory academic progress. These include time frame, grade point average, and pace. For most schools, the grade point average is a 2.0. I will say that some schools will um, do a graduated um, GPA requirement that works from something like a 1.6 up to the 2.0. Um, they would start at a 1.6 um, in the freshman year, and by their senior year, they would be expected to be at a 2.0 GPA to maintain that type of GPA requirement. Um, other schools will just say 2.0 across the board, and they have to be at a 2.0 each year to maintain that component. The time frame is the amount of time it would take a student to complete a program times 150. So if it's a two-year program and you multiply that times 150%, then it would be uh, three years. Three and a half, three. It's three. Three. It's three. So, and if it's a four-year program, then it's going to be six years. They will go by um, by the credit hours most of the time. So, if it's a 124 credit hour program, it's 186 credits. Um, pace is the amount of time that the student, or the amount of hours that the student attempted over the history of the undergraduate program. So, um, they should be at a 67%. Um, and what that would mean is, like, if they took 15 credit hours, they would need to complete nine to meet this component. Okay, so scholarships uh, are considered gift aid, like we talked about earlier. Um, some will have restrictions on what they pay for. So, um, some will only be for tuition. Others will be unrestricted and can apply to any component of the cost of attendance. Um, and so they won't necessarily um, have to worry about that. They also, some of them will have enrollment restrictions. So in other words, they might have to be enrolled full time to receive it. Um, they can come from multiple sources. So institutions, organizations, employers. Um, that list grows all the time. They come from the state. Um, I often say, look in your own community because there's a lot of um, community scholarships that are available. Uh, so for institutions, there is always an application. Um, some of them will have multiple applications. Some will only have one and it will apply to almost all of them. Um, you'll want to know when the deadline is. I know that um, the counselors tonight talked about the scholarship deadlines. So you can go on to any university or college's website and you will have the scholarship online posted somewhere. Um, you'll want to know if it's um, a merit or a based scholarship to determine the eligibility. Um, so do they need to have a certain GPA or do they have to fall within a certain expected family contribution? Some scholarships will require that the student fill out the FAFSA before they can award it. Um, does it require follow-up and is it renewable? And what are the requirements for the renewable scholarship? So if they want to continue to pay attention to each year, what do I need to do to maintain this scholarship if it is renewable? A lot of times it's, they have to meet a certain GPA requirement, like 3.2. So, um, for Kansas Board of Regents, this is their website. They do have multiple scholarship um, opportunities out there. You will um, you will benefit from going to their page because they do um, have that out there. And they have their own scholarship deadlines, so you'll want to pay attention to those. Okay, and these are all of the state programs that students can qualify for if they apply, possibly. Okay. So from here, 
you're going to want to obtain an interview in the missions and the financial aid websites and materials for each school to which you're applying. You're going to want to meet all of the application deadlines. Complete the FAFSA as soon as you leave here tonight. I'm just kidding. Um, it's not open yet. And other application materials and submit all requested follow-up documents and investigate other sources of data. Thank you for hanging out. <laughs> and if you do ever have any questions, the financial aid office will be happy to answer those. So please feel free to call us. And thanks so much for coming.